Welcome to lecture 16 of BIV 102 New Testament Survey. Today's lecture is going to be continuing from the past lecture on 1 Corinthians and finishing it up. So let's go ahead and get started. Letter D. 1 Corinthians gives instructions in matters of church discipline. Now, if you remember from the previous lectures, we've already gone through several different teachings in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we talked about the major purpose and importance of why he wrote it. Now, we've already discussed the divisions that were in the church that Paul addresses, the judgment seat of Christ that we will all stand before one day, and then how Paul cautioned against partiality and pride. Now, we're talking about the section in chapter 6 where Paul gives instructions on matters of church discipline. And he's going to discuss various different issues here, but the first thing that he delves into is he declares that we should not associate with unrepentant fornicators. Unrepentant fornicators. Now the first po problem Paul addresses pertains to an issue in the church of Corinth where fornication, sexual sin, was so rampant that even sons were marrying their stepmothers, basically taking them from their fathers. Paul says that these individuals needed to be cast out of the church because when they were confronted with their sin, they were failing to repent. Then number two, Paul further explains that this does not apply to our association with the unsaved. So the second issue that Paul addresses pertained to a former letter that he wrote to them and he said he needed to clarify it. Apparently, he had told them in that former letter to not keep company with any fornicators. But they took that to mean any fornicators, whether they're saved or unsaved. Paul clarifies this to mean fornicators in the church, not those who are in the world. After all, Paul states that God is the judge of the unsaved, but we are to judge those in the church. And then thirdly and lastly in this section, Paul ends by proclaiming that we should not associate with unrepentant believers. Now the overall theme for this chapter is that we should not associate ourselves with Christians living in sin and refusing to repent. And fornication is not the only issue at hand here. He includes idolatry, drunkenness, all different types of sins. Any sin that we are confronted with and we do not repent about does not mean that we never do it again. It means that if we have the attitude where we don't care about the sin we're committing, then Paul is very, very clear that other believers are not supposed to associate themselves with us. And not only does Paul talk about church discipline, but in chapter 6, 1 Corinthians reproves believers for going to the court before unbelievers. Here's what he says. Number one, he says that we should be able to judge between ourselves because we will one day judge the world and even angels. Apparently, issues were arising in the church of Corinth that were causing them to have to go to court against each other with, for so many different issues. This was appalling to Paul since he reasoned that if we will one day judge the world and even the angels, then we should be able to judge these little matters amongst ourselves. And then secondly, he says, we should be willing to be wronged by another believer if it means being a good testimony to an unbeliever. So even if you don't think that the, hand, the problem can be handled within the church and it's a small issue that does not require legal aid, then you should be willing to be wronged by somebody. I should be willing to be wronged by somebody if it means not being a bad testimony to the world. And then letter F, the next section, chapter 7 through 10, answers questions concerning various practical issues. The first practical issue that Paul is going to address is number one, he tells the church in Corinth that it is better to marry than to commit fornication. In a letter that the church had sent Paul, they apparently asked him concerning the proper relation between a man and a woman that is unmarried. Paul explains in chapter 7 that it is not good for a man to touch a woman. Now, the word touch there in the Greek literally translates as kindle a fire, which is an idiom for basically excite sexually or sexually arouse. 
So he's telling them that if a touch between a man and a woman causes them to be sexually aroused, then they should not do that type of touching. Now, the alternative is that he says they should be married so they don't fall into sin. However, he continues that those who are unmarried and widows should remain unmarried unless they cannot contain themselves because, he says, it's better to marry than to burn with passion and then fall into sin. And then number two, he tells them that singleness allows total dedication to the Lord. He ends chapter 7 by declaring that those who are unmarried should stay that way if possible so that they can be completely devoted to the Lord. Because marriage divides one's time between the spouse, which he calls the things of the world, and the Lord, which Paul calls the cares for the things that belong to God. And then the third and final practical issue that he deals with this section in chapters 8 through 10 is that our personal liberty is not more important than our relationship with other believers. Now the issue here involves whether or not it was right to eat meat that had been offered unto idols, which this passage is extremely similar to Romans chapter 14, which we discussed in a previous lecture. Paul, in various similar lines, explains that since the idols are not real, and that there is only one true God, then there is nothing wrong with eating the meat. However, he says if eating the meat offends or causes a brother or sister to stumble, to sin, then we should not eat that meat. In addition to this, Paul warns against ever partaking in the religious ceremonies of these false idols, which ironically here he calls devils. Instead, all we do should be done for the glory of God. And then letter G, in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives instruction concerning the observance of the Lord's Supper. Now apparently there was a division amongst them, since some were misusing the Lord's Supper as a way to just binge, eat, and drink, and not really as a way to honor the Lord. Paul cautioned them that those who eat and drink of the Lord's Supper unworthily are guilty, and that we should all examine ourselves before partaking in it. In fact, Paul says that this is why some in the church in Corinth had grown weak and gotten sick, because they had eaten of the Lord's Supper unworthily. And next, letter H. 1 Corinthians discusses the purpose and usage of spiritual gifts. The first thing that Paul addresses with spiritual gifts is, he says that they were given for the unity of the body of Christ. In this chapter, Paul lists many spiritual gifts that are given to believers. The gift of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healings, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. But all of these these gifts that he mentions, he declares that they are all done as one body. In fact, he says that each gift is given to complement another gift so that we can all work together and use them for the betterment of the body. Which is why he leads to number two, spiritual gifts are useless if not exercised with love. So after discussing these spiritual gifts, Paul makes mention that he could have every gift listed, but if he didn't have charity, which is love, then they were all pointless. Now, we've already mentioned that no individual is given all of the spiritual gifts because then you wouldn't need someone else. So Paul is using hyperbole saying, if I had all the gifts, but I didn't have love, then it's pointless. Because love for one another is the most important thing, and our exercising of spiritual gifts will be in vain if not used in that love. And in this chapter, he then explains exactly what love is. He says love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love is not proud, love is not disgraceful, love is not selfish, love is not angrily, angered quickly, love does not record wrongs. Love thinks positively, 
Love is happy with good, not with evil. Love is enduring. Love is believing. Love is hopeful. Love is supporting. And then thirdly, Paul says that these spiritual gifts are to be used appropriately. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul starts off by saying that he desired that they would all prophesy over speaking in tongues because he says the purpose of speaking in tongues or speaking in other languages was to give the gospel to unbelievers, but prophecy was given to edify the saints. However, he said if they do speak in tongues, speak in other languages, Paul required that at the most two or three people speak at a time, and he said there must be an interpreter. If there was not an interpreter, he says they must remain silent. And in addition to these stipulations, Paul explains that for whatever reason, he says women were not permitted to speak in tongues in the church. And then finally, Paul concludes this epistle to the church in Corinth by providing support for the future resurrection of believers. He expresses two great principles about the resurrection in chapter 15. Number one, he tells us that Christ's resurrection gives us hope for our resurrection. Paul declares that the resurrection of Jesus is inseparably linked to the resurrection of believers. If we will not one day be resurrected, then Christ will never or was never resurrected either. So Paul says because Christ was resurrected, we have hope of a future resurrection ourselves. And then number two, he says that our resurrected bodies will be incorruptible and immortal. Paul explains that this future bodily resurrection of believers will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Not the blink, the twinkle, the rapid eye movement that our eyes experience every second. It'll happen that quickly at the last trump. And this new body is said to be incorruptible means we will never be able to sin again in it, and immortal, we will never be able to die again. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 16 for BIB 102 New Testament Survey. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or if you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.